Okay, we've got a lot to talk about today, so I'll go ahead and get started. I think I've got 3.59 on one clock, right at four on another. Um, today's topic will be catching up on something um, that we needed to cover for a little bit now, specifically the use of dictionaries in Python. Um, I've got a couple of administrative announcements and explanations first. Then I want to go through and give the actual lecture, and then we will save some time at the end. We have the time to talk about Project One and some things related to that. Um, administratively, uh, as you know, Project One is out. I announced that last week. The design document for Project One is due Wednesday night, so you should be fairly close to finished with it. Project One is a text document. It is all text, if you will. If you're preparing it on GL, it is all comments on Emacs. There's no actual Python code in the design document. It is pseudocode. The design document is a description by you of how you're going to solve the problem, how you get right the program. And we can talk about that a little bit at the end. As I said, I'll try to save some time to talk about project one. Um, you can be writing code. And in fact, what a number of people like to do is sketch out the design and then sort of try to code a little bit, code a function, write a little bit to make sure that it'll actually work. To make sure they have an understanding, but the focus should be on the design, which is how am I going to solve this problem? Okay, that's what's due Wednesday. And again, the code is not due until one week from tonight. So you have one week and eight hours. Although, please don't wait until the last minute to try to get all the code done. Um, looked at the schedule, looked at labs seven and eight, looked at homework assignments, and looked at the calendar and where we're going from here, and changed what I had planned to do a little bit. Um, today, as I noticed, we're going we're gonna to talk about dictionaries. After today, you can do Lab 7. Lab 7 is not due until this Friday. It's fairly quick. We will talk about it toward the end of today's lecture. Uh, on Wednesday, the 28th, we will talk about a concept called mutability. Um, Lab 8 has a little teeny bit on mutability in it. You really can do Lab 8 without mutability because it's mostly two-dimensional lists. But Wednesday's lecture might clear up a couple of things that come up with, with uh, Lab 8. But after that, you'll be set. Now, next week, the 2nd, the 4th, Monday and uh, Wednesday, we will have two lectures on recursion. Recursion is, we have been using a programming technique called iteration. There's another technique called recursion. We will introduce that and spend two lectures on it next week. After that comes exam week. Now, we will do the same thing we did with the previous exam, specifically Monday the 9th. So two weeks from today, that Monday, we will review for the exam, cover any missed details, go over anything that's, that's outstanding. And you will take exam number two in class during the class period on Blackboard, just like exam one, that will happen Wednesday. Now, that's really something that's different between us and the majors classes. It's just that I want to have it be online in that time frame so it's over and done with and I'm available to answer questions, what have you. Um, the majors are, are doing another essentially take-home exam where they get the exam on Monday and they have it till Friday to finish it. Uh, and while they do that, they continue to have lectures, which is how we kind of got behind them on the dictionaries. You know, when we teach this class in person on campus, you can't continue to lecture during exam weeks. Uh, so that's kind of how we got behind them. Uh, they continue to lecture. We stopped and took the test and that'll happen again. After the 11th, after the exam two weeks from now, we traditionally diverge a lot from the major section. That's where this section really becomes different. Um, they're just covering fundamental comp sci topics. We're going to focus on using uh, comp sci and Python to solve problems in your areas of study. So we do a lot of data analysis. We do a lot of graphics. We do some 
Jupiter notebooks, we use some other stuff. So after the 11th, we will really kind of diverge from them. And you may notice if you look at their schedule that they're t- not taking their exam the week of the 11th, they're taking their exam the week of the 18th. So this is because we're supposed to track them closely up until then, then we've split off. But that's our schedule. Dictionaries today, mutability Wednesday. You can do labs seven and eight, both with no problem after that. Next week, two lectures on recursion. Uh, then after that, the exam. And then after that, I'll I'll tell you where we're going. For planning purposes, even though project one is not due until next Monday, I'm going to put project two out this Friday. Don't worry about it if you can't get started. Don't worry about it if you're doing the project one. It's just going to be out there if you want to get started. You'll have until the 13th, the fr- that Friday the 13th, and it's going to focus on recursive programming. And if it's necessary, I can give an extension and, and make it not do the 13th. We can give you more time. Uh, but I think it's it's fairly straightforward. I think you can get it done with all the materials and lecture. And then the big project, Project 3, comes out the 14th. That's not due until the 4th of December. You get three weeks because there's a Thanksgiving holiday in there and everything else. And again, it tends to focus on Python libraries and tools, doing some data analysis, doing some pretty good graphics, doing some presentations. It's kind of a bigger effort. So that's why you get three weeks for that. This is just for planning purposes. The last lecture on the calendar is Monday, the 7th of December. Tentatively, the final exam is scheduled for the class period uh, which is Monday, the 14th of December, 3.30 to 5.30. Again, it'll be online. So if you're going to have a conflict on that 14th of December, let me know as soon as possible. We can avoid it. Uh, because the majors are going to do their essentially take-home final again, uh, we don't have the common final that that there usually is. I don't know if it's good or bad, but historically, 201 has had a common final, and we always get Friday night. So just because you... Don't have anything else to do on your Friday nights in December. That's when you take your final. That will not happen this semester. Tentatively, we're scheduled for Monday the 14th. That's where we're going administratively. So that's why I wanted to make sure everybody's on board with that. I put out an announcement on Blackboard to this effect to make sure everybody knows where we're going. That's what it looks like. Now, so administratively, that's where we are. That's the work. Let's get to talking about dictionaries. What is a dictionary? Well, if you want to find the definition of a dictionary, go to dictionary.com and look it up. And I copied and pasted this, you know, fairly long dictionary. Uh, What is a definition? What is a dictionary? Oh, it's a book, optical disc, blah, 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 blah. The thing that becomes relevant in this definition is down here in the bottom where they talk about computers. A dictionary is a list of codes, terms, keys, etc., and their meanings used by a computer program or system. That is what we mean by a dictionary. That is what we're doing in Python. Okay, so in Python, the definition of dictionary that we care about is a list of codes, terms, keys, and their meanings used by a computer program or system. And it's not just meaning, meanings specifically we are going to have a key and we're going to have a set of values associated with that key. So a dictionary defines a relationship between keys and values. That's what the term dictionary means. In Python, a dictionary, or for short, it's a dict, D-I-C-T, and that uses curly braces. Okay, we use parentheses, you already know that. We use square brackets for list. We use curly braces for dictionaries. A dictionary has a set of keys, each key followed by a colon, and then after the colon comes the value associated with that key. You can have many, many key value pairs in the dictionary, and each pair is separated by a comma. So you have a key, colon, a value, comma, a key, colon, a value, comma, a key, colon, a value, and so on. All right, enough about theory and definitions. Let's talk about an example. Suppose I want to tell you about dogs. These are dogs that I have currently or have had in the past. Okay. 
let's go to PyCharm, where I loaded this and actually debugged the darn thing, so I know it works. I have a set, I have a dictionary. The dictionary defines a set of dogs of mine. Now, the first key, the first dog, has the name Doug. What kind of dog is Doug? He's taking a nap over here to my left. Doug is a combination beagle and bulldog, according to my vet. I've had other people say he's different than that, but, but for now we're going to say the vet is right. Doug is a mixed beagle and bulldog. Now, my daughter has another dog, Lizzie, who was here this weekend because I was dog sitting. Lizzie is an Australian cattle dog or a blue healer, but we're going to call her an Australian cattle dog. When I was a kid, I had a cocker spaniel whose name was Penny because she was the color of a copper penny. So Penny was a spaniel. Uh, the first dog my wife and I had after we got married was named Bonnie. Bonnie was a beagle. And then before Doug, we had a dog named Remy. Remy was a shepherd mix. He was not a pure German shepherd. He was a shepherd mix. So that is a dictionary. That is a set of dogs with their values, keys. Again, curly braces. Curly braces mean this is a dictionary. Key, keys, we'll talk about what types are allowed. But for now, these are strings. These keys are strings that represent a dog name, followed by a colon, followed by some type that indicates what type the dog is. Now, since Doug is not a purebred, he's a mix. He gets the list, eagle and bulldog. Lizzie is an Australian cattle dog. Lizzie just gets a string, and so on. So let's go ahead and hit enter. So Python recognizes that this uh, dictionary is defined, and we can see that, yep, yeah, it's taken it, Python's taken it, this is what dogs is, it's a dictionary. Now, we had these keys, so let's look at what are the keys in our dictionary. If you want to see what a key, what the keys of the dictionary are, just type dogs.keys with a parenthesis. Dogs.keys parentheses will give me back the keys in diction in the dictionary dogs. And it will tell me that the keys are this set of Doug, Lizzie, Penny, Bonnie, and Remy. These are my five keys. Now, what if I want to find out what values I have in my dictionary? I simply say dogs.values. The values in my dictionary are the list of Beagle Bulldog, the string Australian cattle dog, the string spaniel, the string beagle, and the string shepherd. So I have my dictionary defined this way by putting it in curly braces, key, colon, value, comma, key, colon, value, comma, key, colon, value. And when I'm all done, Python says the keys of this dictionary are Doug, Lizzie, Penny, Bonnie, and Remy. And the values of this dictionary are the list beagle and bulldog, then the strings, Australian cattle dog, spaniel, beagle, and shepherd. Okay, let's go back to the slides. So this is an example. As I said, the keys are just those strings, and the values are the strings and lists that make this up. Okay, that is a dictionary. Why would I want to use this? Because I want to keep a list of all the dogs that I have in my family, have or have had. And I'm going to add to one in a minute. Now, rules for keys and values. Keys must be unique, and you'll learn this on Wednesday, immutable. Now, for now, don't worry about that word immutable. That's Wednesday's lecture for now. Keys in dictionaries can be ints, integers, floats, floating point numbers, booleans, or strings. That's the only types that can be keys in dictionaries right now, ints, floats, booleans, and strings. What does it mean to say that a key has to be unique? Well, a key can only appear once in a dictionary. It's illegal to list a key, for example, Doug, with two different values. Doug, Beagle, Doug, Bulldog is not permitted. So that's why we put those two values in the list and Doug gets those two values. Okay. 
Keys have to be unique. You cannot have two different definitions for the same term. Values can be anything. There are no practical restrictions. In our dog definition, the value of Doug is the list Beagle and Bulldog because he's both. So values can be anything. They do not have to be unique, right? Beagle is a part of Doug, but Beagle is also Bonnie. That's fine. Doesn't matter. We can have two different Beagles. And in fact, over my life, I've had about seven or eight of them. Okay. There are no restrictions on values. They don't have to be unique. They don't have to only be this set of type, set of types, ints, floats, boolean strings. They can be anything. Okay. Um, yes, you can even make nested dictionaries. A value a, in a dictionary can be another dictionary. It's sort of like a two-dimensional list, a list of lists, okay? A 2D list, a list of lists, a value in a dictionary can be a dictionary. It's sort of a 2D dictionary. We don't use the term 2D dictionary. We just say nested dictionaries. That's okay. And again, value is, values can be repeated. I used to have two beagles when I was a teenager, Baron and Cleo. I create a dictionary like old dogs, Baron is a beagle, Cleo is a beagle. Not a problem that we have repeated the value beagle. That's okay. So for now, keys have to be unique. They have to be either ints, floats, booleans, or strings. Values can be anything. Those are rules. How do you create a dictionary? Well, we've already looked at one example. Okay, now let's look at another one. Let's suppose I'm creating a dictionary with the governors of the states. Okay, I can do this one of two ways. I can create an empty dictionary. Governors equals curly races. What that means is I have defined an empty dictionary. Now, this is a dictionary that I'm going to use to keep track of who the governor of the current states are. How do I add one? In the code I've given you, I've given you an example of defining it with the values already there. Let's go ahead and add one. The governor of Maryland, so I'm going to add a value to my dictionary, dot, um, I'm sorry, I get this right. Governors of Maryland, the string equals Hogan. The governor of Maryland is a man named Larry Hogan. Okay, by doing this, I have added the value Hogan to the dictionary governors under the key Maryland. So the syntax can be confusing because we're, we're overloading square brackets. We're reusing square brackets. This is not a list. It's very common, very common typo to use parentheses and to say governor's parentheses Maryland. That's not valid. If I said governor's parentheses Maryland equals Hogan. I'm going to get a syntax error because it doesn't know what's going on. Okay. This is not valid to use parentheses. This will happen to you a lot. It happens to all of us as we start to learn to code. And even if we're experts in coding, this is kind of weird syntax. You've got to get used to it. If you add an entry to a dictionary, you do it by using square brackets. Um, Yes, by the way, Doug is named Doug because my daughter loved the movie Up, if you've seen that. If you see the movie Up, Doug is the dog. My daughter loved that. Therefore, he's Doug. Okay. So, at any rate, square bracket. So, now we've added the governor of Maryland is Larry Hogan. Well, the governor of Virginia is a guy named Ralph Northam. So, let's add him to the dictionary. The governor of Louisiana is a guy named John Bell Edwards. So let's add him. Now let's look at the value 
of our dictionary governors. Now, the value of our dictionary governors is these three things, the key Maryland, value Hogan, the key Virginia, value Northam, the key Louisiana, value Edwards. They're all strings. That's fine. This is a simple dictionary. It's all strings. If I wanted to add the governor of New York, I would say governors New York is Andrew Cuomo. Let's add him. And now our dictionary of governors has this additional value, Andrew Cuomo. Up here, this statement, this line in the code file and the one on the slide is the other way to define a dictionary, okay? You could just like you could define a list with values initially. You can you can define a dictionary with values initially, and so this was a case of defining the uh, dictionary of governors with values already pre-populated. What I've done down here in the code is add values one at a time. Now, dictionaries are remember keys are unique. Well, that seems reasonable for governors. There can only be one governor of a state at a time. There have been some interesting, if you study your American history, there have been some interesting cases where one governor claimed another governor resigned and you had two people claiming to be governor and it doesn't work. That would be Louisiana. I lived there a long time. I'm allowed to say it. Um, there were some interesting situations where multiple people claimed to be governor at the same time and the state police and the courts and everybody else got involved. But realistically, you're only allowed to have one governor at a time. Now, let's hypothesize that Larry Hogan decided to step aside as Maryland governor. He would be replaced by his lieutenant governor, a man by the name of Boyd Rutherford. In that case, we would change the value. So how do you change a value associated with a key in the dictionary? You would say governors of Maryland would no longer in that case be Larry Hogan. It would be, and if I typed right, it would be useful, Boyd Rutherford. This changes the value. This changes because Maryland can only appear once. This takes care of getting rid of that value and replacing it with the name of the Lieutenant Governor. Okay. So, lots of stuff going on there. Let's get back to the slides and see if we can summarize it, because I think I got everything. Okay, we talked about how to create a dictionary, empty or with content, either one. Let's get back to this one in a minute. Um, where am I? I've jumped ahead. Let's come back then and fix this. Okay. So we put values in there. You can only have you can have a list, but you can only have values associated with the key once. Important point. Dictionaries are unordered. We can only reference elements in a dictionary by using the key. There is no first element of a dictionary. Okay, let me explain this in PyCharm. I have a list, let's say my student list equals the list of A, B, I gotta be consistent, and C. That's a list. It has a definitive order. Student list sub zero has a value. Student list sub zero is A. It's the ordered value. But let's look at governors again. There is no order. You don't have 
this is sub zero, this is sub one, this is sub two. It doesn't work that way. If you said governors sub zero, it tells you, no, that there's no meaning. Okay, I don't have a meaning. Ah, but maybe you want governors using curly brackets, sub zero. What would happen if I did that? Nope, different syntax error. The bottom line is a dictionary is unordered. We do not know whether uh, or which element comes first, which element comes last, whether Maryland comes before Virginia or not. That allows Python internally to store this dictionary however it wants. We don't care. We have no control. An ordered structure, lists are ordered. Each list element has an index. You can give the index, you can give the value. Dictionary is not, there's no first element in the dictionary. There's no first key, there's no value. I showed you with governors, uh, the same thing with our list dogs. If you say dogs of zero, it's undefined. You get an error if you try to reference it. It doesn't matter if you use parentheses, square brackets, curly braces, all of those are gonna fail because the zeroth element, the initial element in dogs is undefined. It doesn't have a meaning. There's you know, nothing to this. Well, if you can't access an element of a dictionary by its uh, index, how do you do it? The only answer is by key value, okay? So, just like when we look in the physical dictionary book, I go to Merriam-Webster's Dictionary or the Oxford English Dictionary or whatever I happen to have on my shelf. I think I have my wife's Oxford English Dictionary back there. What I do is I look in the dictionary for the key. I look for you know, the word I'm going to find the definition of. I look for the word I'm going to find the value of. I can look for the key. Okay, let's go back to my dogs list. Okay, dogs of Doug. And I have to have strings there, uh, uh, quotes there because it's a string. Dogs of Doug is the list Beagle Bulldog. Dogs of Lizzie is an Australian cattle dog. I input the key, I get a value. You use the square brackets to indicate that this is, I'm looking for the key. You cannot look for value. If I said, I want to find the name of the dog who is a spaniel. Here's a value. Give me the key that matches the spaniel. The answer is, there is none. You cannot search a dictionary in Python by value. You cannot look up a value, a, a dictionary entry in Python by looking for something with the right value. You have to know the key. This sort of makes sense. Pardon me. If we go back to the paper dictionary, the book, right? You cannot look up a domestic quadruped of the genus Canis, right? You don't start that way and say, what word has that definition? You'd never find it. The dictionary, the paper dictionary is not structured that way. That's the def part of the definition of a dog, by the way. Okay, it's domestic quadruped, four-legged four -legged beast that's domesticated, that's part of the canis, the wolf uh, genus, and you go down from there. So just like you don't look up a word in the dictionary by its definition and find a word that matches that definition, you don't look up a value in a Python dictionary and find the key that matches it. You have to find you have to search by the key. Now, as we have shown, though, we can sort of get around this because we can get a list of all the values. And we can sort of cheat that way. But even getting the value, I cannot take this value. I cannot say, ah, what state is north of the governor of? It's not going to work. I can't go find the key that matches this value. Python does a dictionary like the paper dictionary. 
yeah, I can get a list of all the values, but I can't go then from a value and match a key. I have to go from a key to value. Key to value only, no value to key. Again, looking at a, um, excuse me, looking at a dictionary uh, and looking at the value associated, I can find the value associated with a specific key. Dogs of Doug gives me a value. Now, what if I tried to access a key that isn't there? When I was very, very young, we had a dog named Pepper. Pepper was also a bulldog. Okay. But Pepper isn't in my dictionary. There is no definition in my dictionary for Pepper. What's going to happen? The answer is if I say a dog name that's not there, if I say a key that's not in my dictionary, what's going to happen is you get a key error. Okay. The key error means Pepper is not in your dictionary. So, if I'm using an assignment, I can add Pepper. That's okay, but if I reference a dog who's not there, a key that's not there, that's an error. So, going back to that slide, what if a key is not present, dogs of pepper? Pepper's not there. That gives you an error. Okay. Now, Python, in addition to just stating something, Python gives you a few methods to access dictionaries that we're going to look at. And this is all the Lab 7 stuff. Okay. You want something that's more resilient to errors. You may not know if the entries in the dictionary or not when you write your code. And so you can use a method called get. Okay. Let's go back to PyCharm. Well, I've since put Pepper in my dictionary. So I'm going to have to go to another dog, the one I mentioned, Baron, the, the, the um, Beagle. Let's look for the Baron. You can never name a beagle Snoopy, by the way. And so since you can't name your beagle Snoopy, you name him the Red Baron, or Baron for short. This is how the dog got his name. My family's weird. I'm a geek. I teach computer science. It's the way it goes. Dogs of Baron is an error because Baron doesn't exist. I haven't put him in my dictionary. It's too long ago. Well, I can say dogs.get Baron. Now, remember, these are strings, so cases they're case-sensitive, case matters, I have to match. If I want to make this code more resilient, I would be using uppers and lowers and things like that. But for now, everything's going to be lowercase for the most part. Uh, I'll just have to match exactly and remember when I type my string. So dogs.get of Baron, well, it returns zero. It returns this value specifically, none. Okay. The program does not crash. Notice there was no failure right here. There was no failure right here. The get method returns the specific value, none. Now, remember when we talked about functions. We talked about functions. If you don't have a return statement or you don't return anything else, you return the special value, none. This is the same value, none. This is the value none of type, none type. It's the same thing. So you know that if you use the get method and the dog does not appear in the dictionary, the governor does not appear in the dictionary, um, you're going to get back the value none. So you can write your code that says as long as this is not none, then continue to work. And it's better than just getting the value and dying a horrible death because it's not there. The nice thing about get is you can also tell it, well, don't give me back none. Give me some other error message. Do something else. A lot of programming languages, things, if they fail, return negative one. So I can do this. I can say dogs.get 
and I'll print this out so you'll see it. Print dogs.get Baron negative one. What this syntax says is go to the dictionary dogs, get the value that's associated with Baron. If this is not found, return negative one. And since with this line of code I just printed out, this shows you that the method dogs.getBaron will return negative one if Baron is not there. Now, for another dog that is there, let's say print dogs.get of Doug. If Doug is not there, return negative one. Well, this still returns Beagle Bulldog because Doug is there. Get returns the value associated with this key, so I didn't have to do anything. Okay, I didn't have to do anything. Now I can return negative one. That's simple, I think. Let me double check the slides real quick. I give an example. Oh, yeah, I return the statement key not found. I can have, instead of returning negative one, I can return the string key not found. I can do whatever. Okay, in this case, with a print statement, this makes more sense. Baron is not there. If you do not find this key, return the error message key not found. I'm printing it out. This prints key not found. So the get method is a nice thing to have to use to find. Remember, it gets the value associated with the key. This gets a value associated with a key. If this key is not there, by default, it returns none, the special value none, instead of erroring out so your program doesn't crash. If you want it to return something other than none, you have a second value in the parentheses, return the string key not found, return the integer negative one. So if you are concerned in your dictionary with trying to find a value associated with a key, and the key might not be there, you use the get method. This was the thing I was, the slide I was looking for a little earlier. Uh, I've already got, I'll, I'll summarize this, I've already covered it. When you want to add a new value to a dictionary, it's just an assignment statement. Dogs of Cinder is a Doberman. She was a dog I had also years ago. Okay. So dogs of Cinder doesn't exist. But if I want to add her, it's just an assignment statement. When you have an assignment statement, if the dog, if the entry does not exist in the dictionary, this adds it. If this does exist in the dictionary, this changes it because it can only appear once. So now if I say, no, I don't want to call her a Doberman because that's not sufficient. She was, in fact, a black Doberman as opposed to a red Doberman. Okay. This, the entry was not there. It added it. This, the entry was there. It changed it. Back to the slide. Okay. To add the new value, just use an assignment statement. There's no append, there's no insert. Remember the list, there's an ordering. With the list, there's an ordering, so you have to tell Python, where do I want this to go in the list? Append, put it at the end, insert, and put it in the specific value. In a dictionary, you have no control where this goes. You have no control where this goes. So there's no such thing as append or, assert, append or insert. Just say assign it, put it in there somewhere, I don't care. Again, as I just showed, if the key already exists, it just overwrites the value associated with the key. Uh, it doesn't add a new element because an element can only appear once and that element's already there. How do I remove an element from the dictionary? With the statement del or delete. Delete from the dictionary key. Now, delete is also useful for lists, remember. That's okay. Python can tell whether we're talking about a dictionary or a key a dictionary or a list. Dell does one thing for lists. Dell does another thing for dictionaries. Python can tell the difference. That's not a problem. You want to remove a key, remove a value from the dictionary, use Dell, 
and then the dictionary name, and then the key name. Again, if that per key doesn't exist, you'll error out. Okay, so be careful using Dell. We'll talk about how to avoid this in the middle. What do we got in dogs right now? Doug, Lizzie, Penny, Bonnie, Remy, Pepper, Cinder. Okay, let's get rid of Pepper. Dell, dogs of Pepper. Cool. Check the value of the dictionary dogs. Pepper's gone. Everybody else is still there. Works perfectly. What if I used another dog that wasn't there? Okay. Never put Cleo in there, but let's use her anyway. Delete Cleo. You can't delete Cleo. Your program just died. She doesn't exist. So what do I do if I want to delete something that isn't there? I use the example of Lady. Lady was another dog. Um, you can use pop. So the equivalent to pop is uh, the equivalent to get for adding or for getting value is pop for removing. Pop causes an error if lady is not a key in the dictionary, but you can say what the hap what happens. Okay. Let me be consistent and instead of use Cleo, I'll use lady got in the slides. Okay, Dell, dogs, of Cleo, of Lady. Error, program died, Lady doesn't exist. Okay, dogs.pop. It's a parenthesis, not a square brackets, of Lady. Okay, not so great, but lady does it because there's still error, but I can fix that. I can say dogs.pop of lady, and if lady is not there, return this special value none, which is of none type. Okay, so if I print dogs.pop of lady none, it prints out none, okay? It prints out the special value none of type, none type. This causes the program not to fail. Your program doesn't die when you use pop. It's more robust, it's more resilient. So as I say in the slide, a more resistant, re resilient way to delete is the pop method. You can say, don't die if this, do if this dog isn't in the, in the dictionary, if this key is not there, do this instead, return none, return negative one, do something else. So pop and get are useful because they stop your program from dying. There's a related method called pop item. This is not something you'll probably ever use in programming. You might, if you will, be adventurous, what have you. Uh, there was a change in Python 3.7. In Python 3.7, pop item removes the last most recent item inserted into the dictionary. The most recent item comes out in pop item, which sort of cheats because it sort of introduces a time-based ordering into the dictionary, but that's kind of okay. What pop item did in previous versions, so when I taught this course in fall of 2019, uh, we weren't using 3.7, we were using 3.5. Pop item removed a random item from the dictionary. Literally did it. We removed a random item from the dictionary. And I always wondered, who on earth wants to write code that removes random data from your data set? Or removes random elements from dictionaries? That's bizarre. And apparently the, the powers that be at Python finally agreed with me and they got rid of it in um, uh, 3.7. So pop item removes the last item from the dictionary. You probably won't be using that in your but if you ever run across it, that's what it does. And if you find those people who are still wedded to using Python 2.7 from about six years ago, they'll tell you it removes a random element. It doesn't anymore. Major differences. Good test question. What's the difference between a dictionary and a list? Two closely related things. A list 
establishes a binding between a value and a location. A list is ordered. It establishes a binding between a value and its location. List sub zero is New York. List sub one is California. List sub two is Maryland, et cetera, et cetera. A dictionary, on the other hand, establishes a binding between the key and a value. There is no ordering. There is no location. Okay, governors of Maryland equals Hogan. But whether governors of Maryland comes before or after governors of Virginia, we do not know and we do not care. A list is ordered, a dictionary is unordered, and because of that, the list establishes a binding between the value and the location. The dictionary is a binding between a key and a value. Checking time real quick. Looks like I'm still doing okay. All right, so what? When do you use a dictionary? Well, you don't care about ordering, and you want to have... You, need, you have unique keys, and they map to values, okay? The dog's example, a set of dog names, set of whatever. Um, you could use lists. You could, you could have a list of dog names with uh, their breeds, but it would be very awkward to program that using lists. I mean, it could be done, but you could be very awkward to program, you know, two-dimensional or three-dimensional lists uh, to, ma to map all of these dog names to their breeds. It's much, much easier to map the dog name to the dog breed using dictionary. Key is name, breed is value. It's just easier to do it. Let's look at another example. This is from a homework problem that I gave fall of 2019. One of the homework problems is you have a recipe um, and we're going to have the user walk through and make sure he or she has enough of each ingredient to make chocolate chip cookies. You want to make chocolate chip cookies, you've got to have the right amount of the right ingredients. We're going to write a program that checks all your ingredients, all your stock on hand. And if it, you don't have enough of the right thing, it's going to um, tell you you got to go to the store. Uh, I went and got a recipe for chocolate chip cookies from AltonBrown.com. If you haven't seen Alton Brown, he's a geek chef. He tells you scientifically why cheese works the way it is and what the difference is between a soft cheese and a hard cheese. And he tells you the chemistry of what's happening when you're barbecuing meat. It's just, you know, to me, kind of cool because I'm a geek. Um, so I went and got the chocolate chip cookie recipe from AltonBrown.com. And I'm going to take the recipe and I'm going to put it in the dictionary. The dictionary keys are going to be the ingredients I need to make my chocolate chip cookies, butter, eggs, flour. The values are going to be the quantity. Now, the recipe on the right is actually what you find if you go to the website. Eight ounces of unsalted butter, 12 ounces of bread flour, a teaspoon of kosher salt, a teaspoon of baking soda, etc. What I did was I created a dictionary using that and I said, Recipe equals the dictionary, butter, two sticks, flour, 1.5 cups, salt, one teaspoon, and so on. I took this recipe that I got off a website, and I made a Python dictionary out of it. Now, it gets kind of ugly, right, to keep two sticks, uh, one and a half flours, eight ounces, by the way, of butter is two sticks, uh, one and a half cups of flour, one teaspoon of salt, and what have you. So I just left out the units, figuring I probably know them. So here is a simpler version of the dictionary with my recipe. Um, my recipe is this dictionary right here. Butter, two sticks, eight ounces if you prefer. I use two sticks. Flour, one and a half. I know when I'm talking flour, I'm talking cups. Salt. One, yeah, teaspoons. You really don't want to use a tablespoon of salt unless you're making a ginormous portion. Baking soda, one. Granulated sugar, 0.25 cups, etc. This is my dictionary. Now, how am I going to use that? Well, what I'm going to do, and this was the homework last time or in the fall, is we had the students write a routine that 
the student came up and said, I want to make chocolate chip cookies because it's 2020 and it's that kind of a year. Well, have I got enough stuff to make chocolate chip cookies? The way the program worked is it asked you how many of each ingredient in the recipe you had. And if you didn't have enough, it would tell you what you need to do. Okay, so first, how many eggs do you have? I am out of eggs. I have no eggs whatsoever. Uh-oh, add a dozen eggs to my grocery list. How many ounces of chocolate chips do you have? Um, four. Four ounces of chocolate chips is not enough. Get a bag of chocolate chips at the store. And this is the only part of that code I imported, but we had the the students had to write the code that walked all the way through the recipe and checked every ingredient and made sure you had enough on hand. If you had enough, how many eggs do you have? 12. Nothing to do. You got 12 eggs. How many ounces of chocolate chips do you have? 16. I have a pound. Eh, there's nothing to do, right? This was what the program did. The way it did it is by looking at the dictionary. The dictionary had the values, the quantities of how much you need, and it found the value and decided whether you had enough. And if it didn't have enough, it added a dozen eggs to your grocery list, or it actually wrote the list for you eventually. This was the simplified version. Right? So here's the case where I used the dictionary to hold the elements, the ingredients I needed in a recipe of chocolate chip cookies. And I could use it in a nice program for the user to say, have you got enough? If you don't have enough, do something like print out or go to the store or what have you. That's the simple case. Here's the code that I used in the program. Now, one more topic, just because I need to cover it because you're going to have to use it. Zip and the constructor method dict. TLDR is on the left. Here's the code. We'll walk through it in PyCharm. The longer story. Let's go to PyCharm and work with it. I have two lists, A and B. A is the list 1, 2, 3. B is the list 4, 5, 6. Cool. No big deal. A is a list. B is a list. Now, if I want to create something from these two lists, I have the built-in function zip. The way zip works is it takes the elements in order. It will take the first element of A and then append the first element in B and then go back and take the next element in A and the next element in B and it will keep going until it has exhausted all the elements. Now, in this case, A and B are the same length. If they're not the same length, it will keep zip, keep going until it's exhausted all the elements of the shorter list, and then everything else in the longer list just is added in order. There's nothing else to zip over. So conceptually, you can think of a zipper zipping up and the teeth coming into the zipper in order and just all zipping together in a row, one after another, okay? The problem with zip is it doesn't produce a useful value. Let me see. C is the result of zipping A and B. I would hope C is the list A and B, uh, the list 1, 4, 2, 5, 3, 6. But in fact, when I ask Python what C is, I get a completely and totally useless response. Zip produces an internal value, a zip object, which is not usable by humans. It's only usable by Python internally. So zip by itself produces nothing I as a human can use. But I have a constructor dict, D-I-C-T, dict says, take whatever is in here and make a dictionary out of. As long as it's the right type, it will work, okay? So I can say, take whatever's in C, which is this internal zip object, 
and I can and make a dictionary out of it. Now, when I look at D, I have a valid Python dictionary that I, as a human, can understand. So the combination of zip and dict together can turn two lists into a dictionary. And if I want to say all in one statement, um, D, let's go with E equals dict of zip of the list one, two, three, and the list four, five, six, do in one statement what I did in four, that will actually work as well. Okay, so this is just a way of doing this all in one statement instead of a bunch. It all works. The bottom line on all this is zip and dict, the zip function and the dict constructor together can let you build the dictionary out of two lists. You can't do anything with either one by itself, but you can create it. You can create a, a dictionary. Now, I want to do a real quick run through on lab seven, just to make sure, since now you'll be able to do it. Lab seven is just manipulating dictionaries like we've done in this um, lecture. Okay. The text of the lab uh, is a review of dictionaries, talks about keys and values. In this example, they're strings. Iterating, you can actually use a for loop. Remember, I showed you very early on that if you want to get all the list of keys, you just use dot keys. So dogs dot keys. No, oh, I used dog rather than dogs. Dogs.keys, I have this thing. So I can say for key in dogs.keys, print key. Okay, and it prints the strings that were in dogs.keys. Similarly, for values, I can say for value in dogs.values print value. And when I do this, it prints out all the values I have. So in lab seven, we're just uh, 1B just tells you, you know, this is the same thing, how to go through it. 1C, inserting a new value, that's with an assignment statement, just like we talked about. 1D, what kinds of things can be values? Anything. Don't worry again about keys have to be immutable. We'll explain that on Wednesday for now. What that means is keys can be ints, floats, strings, or booleans. That's all they can be. Um, values can be anything. Values can be a dictionary. Values can be a list. Values can be whatever. OK, and there's some examples in the sub in the assignment about what to do or in the lab about what to do if indeed a value is a dictionary. Uh, you can walk through that. It's pretty straightforward. In this is what we just showed. OK, for keys in. Um, you can check use in to see if it's in keys. You can use in to see if it's in values. You can use the in keyword. Uh, to see if there's a, uh, if the value is there. The del keyword, we talked about how to get rid of it, but what happens in the uh, event of an error of a key not being there? Dict.keys and dict.values we just talked about. Now, the Lab 7 exercise, uh, you'll be working with some code, and uh, you just go use a dictionary and go through each person is an entry in the dictionary. The favorite numbers are the values, and they are represented as a list. So the key is the person. Specifically, the key is a string without spaces. Okay, and the names are go the na the names are the keys. The uh, values are going to be their favorite numbers. You're going to have to split what you get from the file. 
Okay. Pass in the person number and the favorites dictionary and make sure that the value is in the dictionary and go through. Starter code is here. It's pretty straightforward. Should not take you more than half hour, 45 minutes, assuming no problems getting the starter code. You should still be able to get the starter code. And then realistically, it's straightforward. You just use the things we've talked about in this class. Get, Dell, pop, um, and then accessing the values. So lab seven at this point should be straightforward. I did, by the way, look at lab eight. Lab eight is working with 2D lists, which we talked about last week. You should not have a problem with that. I'm sorry, just gonna put the time in. That's the issue. Um, so you should be able to handle all of that. We're caught up. You do need you know, more on mutability and immutability and everything else, which we'll talk about on Wednesday. I did want to show an example of how you could use dictionaries to do project one. Please do not use dictionaries for project one. They are not required. If you get all gung ho, you could do it, but please don't. Okay. If you looked at the data files for project one, they look at things like this. The, this is fall 2021.txt. The first line is useless. It tells you it's the fall 2021 class. The second line is useless. It tells you what the fields are. The student name, student ID, project one grade, project two grade, etc. Now, because I stored these as, as text, as plain text, the fields do not line up with the headings. That doesn't matter. Don't get wrapped up over the fact that I, the fields don't match with the headings. This, at, this started life as an Excel spreadsheet. It then became a Google sheet, and it then became a plain text table. Things do not line up. The student name is Werner Heisenberg. Werner's student ID is LF1769. Werner's project one grade is 55. His project two grade is 53. His project three grade is 64. His test one grade is 65. His test two grade is 101. And his test three grade is out of 200 points is 191. So the fields go in order. Last name, comma, space, first name, space, student ID, space, 55, space, 53, 64, 65, et cetera. Okay. So this is going to be read in in that area. You're going to read in the line, and you're going to have to split it. When you split it, this is what you get. This is what the data files look like, and there are four of them for Project 1. Now, getting back to today's coding, I'm going to open that file, fall2021.txt. I made sure it's in the same directory that I'm working on, so I don't have to give the full path name. It's in my Python path. I'm good. I'm going to open it for reading. It would default to reading if I didn't say, but I said it explicitly. And I'm going to call it F. F is going to be uh, the file name, the variable for which I refer to this file. Now, in project one, and we talked about this previously, I'm going to use read line to get rid of that useless line. This first read line gets rid of this the second read line gets rid of that. These are lines that I don't need. So I have two read line statements that I am going to use to get rid of those two lines. You should have something similar in project one. Now, here's a different, I can't give you the answer to project one. In project one, just as I showed last week, then you will use the F dot read statement. You will use the f.read statement in project one to read the whole file as a single string and you have to split it. I'm going to just read one line. I'm going to read the Werner Heisenberg line. How you do this for the whole file, it's fairly straightforward. If you have questions, we'll get to it. But I'm going to read in one line. So this is going to read in the line Werner Heisenberg. Okay. And then I'm going to split it. So let's do that part of the code. Open the file for reading, 
read and throw away this useless line, read and throw away this useless line, read one line, read the Werner Heisenberg line, and then split it on the user, on the uh, blank spaces. Okay, let's look at what data looks like. Data now is a list. Remember, split returns a list and split of the blank spaces. The first value is the last name, Heisenberg, and the comma comes with it. We can get rid of the comma if we want to, or we can just leave it in for now. The next field is the first name. The next field is the student ID. And then I have these strings, remember, because everything's a string, that are your project one score, project two score, project three score, test one score, test two score, test three score. Okay, that's what I've done so far. Now, I'm going to build a dictionary with this. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to have name. I want name. I'm going to combine. I want name field because I may have two people with the same name. I may have Pierre Curie and Marie Curie. So I want to make sure I can distinguish somebody, these Nobel winners. So I'm going to combine these two fields, the last name and the first name, to get a single field that I'm going to call the name. Okay, and so now name is Heisenberg comma Werner. There's no blank spaces. I don't care. That's fine. Now I'm going to build, I'm going to de have to deal with these values that are my project scores and test scores. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a list of the project scores and test scores. Those are going to be the value in my dictionary. Okay, so I start with a blank list I'm going to call scores. And then I'm going to start from data sub three. I'm going to start from this 55, which is the third element, right? Zero, one, two. This is the third element. So I want to start in the third element and go to the end. And I'm going to convert to an integer and I'm going to append to scores. Okay, that ah, skipped one. Sorry, skipped a line. Okay. Let's go back up here. Okay, now if I look at scores. It's the list with the integer values of, of the, the results, my test scores, my program scores. Now I can deal with it, okay? Now all I have to do is create a dictionary. I'm gonna build a dictionary. The name is my key. The scores, project scores and test scores are gonna be my value. And the way I do that is I initialize a blank dictionary, just like I did earlier in the lecture with governors, just like I did with governors, you're going to do this with the data dictionary. The name, I'm going to add a value, which is the name, just like I added Maryland, the governor of Maryland is Hogan. You're going to add uh, the dictionary associated with the name field, which is Werner Heisenberg equals scores. So when I execute this whole thing, I come down here and I want to avoid unfortunate indents. Now I see what my data dictionary is, and it's the dictionary where the key, Werner Heisenberg, has the values of these scores, and I can work to them. That's one line in the dictionary. If I wanted to do that with the entire data file, all I would do is take this whole thing and put it in a for loop and read in the line at a time and add it to the dictionary. And when I do that, I would have my entire data file in a dictionary, and I could then work add it with this list. Now, the specific assignment in project one is to do this with two-dimensional lists, not dictionary, so please do not actually do this, but I could have. I don't think it's easier. I assigned you to do this with the 2D list because I don't think doing it with a dictionary is significantly easier, um, but you could do it if you really wanted to play around. But for the assignment, you have to use a 2D list. I just wanted to illustrate the fact that I said in the slides that you could use dictionaries to do project one. 
that being said, that's all I wanted to talk about dictionaries now. I've got six minutes left. So let's go to project one. I want to talk about that. I want to specifically address the design because that's what you have to submit by Wednesday. The design is worth 10 points out of your 100, out of the 100, this is worth, this document's worth 10 points. You're going to create this file. You can copy, this is the file I've given you as a cop, as a starter. You can start from here, copy this off the GitHub and, and work on it. If you wanna get it up to GL, use SCP, secure copy, put it on there, okay. Quotes, this whole thing is text, right? This whole, there's no code here. This whole file's gotta be text. It's gonna be quotes, uh, so you'll see it. File, whatever you wanna call it, design1.py, design1.pdf, design whatever your file is called. Your name, fall 2020, your lab section, your email. Description of what this file is, what the program does. This description is what the program does. You could pretty much use this, okay? Now, I give you, as an example, the definition of the function called mean. Mean computes the arithmetic mean of a set of numeric values. Its parameter, its input values, is a list of integers or floats that we're going to calculate the mean of. And it's going to return a float that is the mean of the list of elements. Okay, so you've told me that there is a return. You've told me what type this return is, and you've given me a quick description of it. Okay, that's sufficient for that function. Now, I told you you have to have a function called median. Okay, median has a param values. It's a list of integers or floats that we're finding the medians of. It's actually integers. Uh, but the function will certainly work with floats. There's no reason median has to only work with integers. It will work with floats. It's going to return, and we're going to call it a float that's a median of the list, okay? Now, you have to add to this the other functions. And remember in the assignment, I gave you a number of other functions you have to use. So you have to put descriptions like I have for mean and like I have for median, you have to put descriptions of the other functions you're going to use. You must include descriptions of the other functions I gave you, and then you will add any functions you want to add. The last part of the design document is an outline of what your main program, an outline of what your main program will look like. Your main program will read in a file. It will break the file into rows. It will break each, each um, the file comes in as a string. It'll break that into rows. It'll break each name into components. It'll start by calling the function, you know, it'll call this function to do this. It'll call this function to do that. Your main program has some logic in it that you need to describe. Again, this is all comments. There is no code in this at all. You will submit this and the TAs will try to give you a fairly quick turnaround. Uh, and let you know whether you got something you're missing. Um, all text describe what you're doing. You can, it is perfectly acceptable to try to, when you sketch out the design of a function or your main program, it is acceptable to write code. It is acceptable to separately write code and make sure that you're going to be able to do what's in your design. From a computer science standpoint, we want to avoid what's called a pure waterfall method. Waterfall development is, is an analogy to the physical waterfall where water goes down, and once the water goes over Niagara Falls, it ain't coming back up. One way only. Okay. We don't want you to only write the design and then never write code, and then once you start writing code, you can never go change the design. We want you to think about the design. This is what I'm going to try to do. And now I'm going to write some code and, uh-oh, maybe, you know, my, my thought process wasn't correct, right? I thought I could do something, but maybe I found an easier way to do it. Maybe the first way wasn't going to work. Maybe there's something else I need. Maybe I want to add a new function. Maybe this is easier. Maybe something else. So as you write your design, do a little bit of coding to test it out. Now, obviously, don't write all the code. 
but do enough coding to convince yourself that, yeah, I can pull this off. I know how to write this function. This is the best way to do this, and I'm going to go. General guideline, keep as little in the uh, main program as possible. The main program should be pretty much call a function, call a function, call a function, call a function, print results, we're done. Or maybe even not in print results, the main program is call a function, call a function, call a function, call a function, end. Okay. Don't put a lot of logic in the main program. Call a function. Be done. So when we say we want the design document by Wednesday night at midnight, two days plus eight hours, two days plus seven hours now, 55 hours, a lot of time, um, just put in these text descriptions. It's just text. It's just words. It's pseudocode. But be thinking about the code that implements it. As you go through, then you write the code for each function. You test this out. Somebody asked me how long this should be. Not count, well, the design document came out, my design document came out to be about two and a half pages because I have a lot of blank spaces, spaces in there, right? A, blank, a lot of blank lines. It's about two and a half pages long. It's not that bad. It's just short descriptions. You see the description I wrote for median. You see the description I wrote for me. Write about that same description for the other functions. Maybe a little more if you feel you need to. That's all. Nothing more. How long is this program going to be in terms of lines of code? Not counting comments. It'll depend on exactly how you choose to do it, but it really shouldn't be more than a couple of hundred lines. You know, if you're writing more than 200 lines of code, you're probably overthinking this. The core code for this is not very long. I've seen people solve this and do this in, in 100 lines of code. It's just not that long. It forces you to think about it and structure and say, I need a function. I'm going to write it, call it, return. I need another function, write and call it return. I need another function, write and call it return. In terms of the data, it's being able to take this data file, read it in, right? I've got a read line statement that throws this away. I've got a read line statement that throws this away. Now I've got a read statement that takes everything else here and reads it as a single string. Now all I have to do is break it up. If I split on new lines, I read in my file, there's a new line at the end of every line. If I split on new lines, I now have rows. Okay, once I have rows, now I can deal with each row. I can split it on blank spaces, and now I've got last name, first name, student ID, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Still have to convert all these comes into strings. Okay, there's nothing I can do. Anything you read from a file comes in as a string. Got to do that. So you got to convert it to integers. I showed you a way to convert all those to integers in one little for loop. You can do that. Okay. And then it's a matter of doing your calculations, calling the mean function to calculate the mean, calling the median function to calculate the median, and so on and so on. It's fairly straightforward. We throw this at you as a hard problem in terms of bigger than you've done before to get you thinking about writing more complex programs, but it's fairly straightforward if you take it a piece at a time. So we've talked about dictionaries. You can do lab seven. You should be able to do lab eight straightforward. We've already talked about 2D lists, but we will talk about mutability on Wednesday in case there's any issues there. Project one. You know what to do for your design document. It's just a text document that says, this is what I'm going to do. Project one, you should be able to get a really good start on it. You should be able to uh, you know, read in those files, break them up, and get the values. Okay, Because the work is coming fairly, fairly fast. There's another project coming right after this one's done. So don't wait for the middle. Don't wait you know, forever for it. This is what you got. Hopefully, that helped you set Get set with where we are and what we're doing and what's coming next. A lot of work, but it's a difficult class, but I'm pleased with how people are doing so far. That being said, I'm going to wrap it up. I will talk to you all Wednesday. I apologize for having to bail right now. My boss at work wants to talk to me because he's in California. Um, I will be available later on this evening. If somebody wants to get in touch with me, I will be available to get in touch. Uh, and between now and Wednesday, anytime, I'll try to help out, office hours, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, other than that, I'll talk to you Wednesday.